How you doing? All right. How the baby's doing? Wow. Good. Uh, nice. Good. Locked in. We're not going anywhere. Oh, uh, good. Now Sorry, see everybody. Just setting up. Yeah, we're figuring this all out. Mm -hmm. This is oh, Let me go grab my guitar. Hold on. You know. He's gonna get <laughs> He's gonna play. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Hi, sweetheart. Oh, I hear, you, I hear you so much better. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. She's been taking good care of me. There he is. Mike! Hey! Hey! How are you? Good to see you. Good. See you too. Fancy. Hey, everybody's looking good. I'm happy to see you all well. James! Hey! James! What's up, man? You he said, hey, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> Yep. You I know. guess the oldest goes first, right? No, no. But but I, I want to, age before beauty. Age before beauty. I want to say, well, he has age and beauty, so you know, what do we? Oh do? well, thank you. What are you doing later? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here all night. <laughs> okay. Genius, uh, devoted uh, to his craftsmanship and and humanity, oh, once said this. I think people today need to hang out more in museums. You need to look at magnificent stuff and get turned on. Uh, who, you know who said that? You just tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds familiar. Yeah, it was you. Yeah, it it's true. Yeah, it's true. It, it was very uh, sincere and simple. You no, know, uh, no matter what age you are, you go to a place like a museum and you'll see some of humanity's greatest works whatever you're into you know right. painting sculpture furniture musical instruments you know whatever you're into right the finest examples are there and i i think you can learn a lot and become inspired by all this mm -hmm. stuff so yeah. it always worked for me I used to get, and still do get, really turned on by seeing like such magnificent things like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's why I hang out with all of you guys, because you all do that. You make amazing art. Right. And it inspires me. My, my father was uh, from Italy, you know, so when I was little, he used to uh, show me picture books of, uh, like instead of baseball and football and all that stuff, Mm -hmm. He used to show me uh, like Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, mm -hmm. and, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and that kind of stuff, you know. Wow. And I thought that was it. That's what what you. That's what people did. <laughs> so when I grow up, I'll paint the ceiling. Right. <laughs> it just was very uh, stimulating. Right. And uh, that kind of got me started. Yeah. I got I got to give my my father a lot of credit. Uh, probably early early 70s when i was in college i used to sit around you know some of my classes were a little boring and i would doodle incessantly in my sketchbooks okay. while i was in class i started sketching instruments uh, i would go down to 48th street you know the music row at the time manny's and sam ash all those great stores look in the windows mm -hmm. and just be amazed at the beauty of some of those fine instruments so I started doodling then in the early 70s, and it just kept going. Haven't stopped. I still do it. Yes. Yeah. It's I fun. See, I see you sketching um, all the I time. I doodle on napkins. When did you and Joey meet? Oh, we first met uh, 19, 
when did we meet? 1980-ish? 81? 79 or 80. I was working on a little guitar shop on Avenue O in Brooklyn, and he literally just knocked on the door. He was curious to see what was going on inside. I wow. think you saw somebody walking out with a gig bag or something. Mm -hmm. Is that it, Joey? No, no, no. Right? You saw somebody Hi, leaving Hi, the Jeremy. shop. Anyway, he knocked My on the door and introduced journey. himself. <laughs> and he hasn't left me alone since. So my journey started. I used to, I, I actually lived very close to the shop where, where he was working. And I used to drive down West 4th Street. The shop was up between West 4th and West 5th Street on Avenue O in Brooklyn. And I used to drive down West 4th Street to go drop my dog off at my mother's house. And I happened to be coming down the block and out of the corner of my eye, I see a little sign on the door. It said, Ken Smith Bases, LTD. I said, what the hell is Ken Smith Bases? And I, um, I had just ordered a Ken Smith Bass. I was working in a music store and I thought that was the Rolls Royce of Bases at the time. Right. And I, so I go and I said, wow, I gotta check this out. So I stopped the car and the door was a little dog, a little Maltese. So I go and I, I go and knock on the door. And I says, this is Ken Smith Basis? He says, yeah, because I, I built, I'm, I'm building, my best that I do, I build the basis. So I says, wow. And I told him that who I was, you know, and I, and I just ordered, and I just had just ordered a two pickup base with all this inlay and my initials and the headstock, it's like $3,500. <laughs> so my wife was pregnant with my daughter and my wife had given me her disability check to order the Ken Smith base. Wow. So I says, wow, great. That's so now I'm going love, there and I see him. And he was working on my base, <laughs> my base. They were building, he was, he was actually working on my base in the shop, you know? So, you know, we became friendly. What did you to stop and buy them? Hmm? I was just thinking, you know, everything that is our company is all because of his dog. If it wasn't for his dog, <laughs> we never would have met. His dog? <laughs> well, because he was taking his dog to his mom's house. And he happened to drive past the, oh. the shop. <laughs> you know, and, and we started, you know, I started going there more often to hang out and say hello. And, you know, he, was, he, he only worked by himself. He was wow. in there by himself. And Smith would only come when something was ready. And then Smith would take the base back to, uh, to Manhattan. And then he would put all the hardware in and make the nut and, you know, and dress it up. So Ken would never, he wasn't there too much. And every time I would go to the shop, Vinny, I was working in a music store also, two days a week, this place called uh, King James Music. So I used to do, you know, setups and little frets things and, you know, stuff, you know, putting them together, taking them apart. And so I had that kind of knowledge all the time, you know, and as well as playing, you know, playing bass. Right. So uh, finally I started actually going to the shop and, and helping, and Vinny was teaching me some woodworking skills, you know, all my woodworking skills I got from him, you know, he taught me all my woodworking skills. Vinny, question for you. Yes. Speaking of woods, right? I was talking yes. to your daughter about this earlier. Um, if you could go to any forest in the world, which part of the world would you want to go to for the purest and most exotic woods or just any forest? Wow. That's a killer. That's a loaded question, man. That's hard <laughs> to answer. I, I, every, you know what? Every almost every part of the world has extraordinary lumber. And so it is really hard to answer, but probably South America has the greatest variety of musical wood. If I had to pick one place, you could get mahogany there, you could get uh, rosewoods there, you could get uh, hardwoods that are a lot like maple. So you, you could build an instrument completely from all the woods on the South American continent. But it's true of here too. I mean, North America, you could build a base entirely from North American woods and so on. But I guess just for sheer variety and diversity, mm -hmm. probably South America, could if you, I had to pick one. If but, you had to pick a place, South America. Could you? Yeah, if I had to. Have yeah. another inch. Are you, I know you love woods, you're into woods. Eh? You're like, you, uh, your face is in wood all day, right? Yes. Yes. Can you close your eyes and tell the difference in some woods just by smell? Some, absolutely. 
they all have their own perfume, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, many are similar, would be hard to tell apart, but there are many that you could di distinguish just by smell alone. Yes, absolutely. You know, when I was a kid, I used to think cherry Does wood. Does that make me a geek of some kind? No, no, know. no. When I was a kid, I used to it think is. cherry wood smelled like cherries. <laughs> it actually, you know, when you, it has different odor depending, like if you cut it raw, fresh, it has the most cherry-like smell. Are you serious? But if you dry it and then you burn it, it's like it depends on. How. Is there a certain grit built into the fabric of, of the company? Like for instance, would Federa Guitars be the same had it developed, let's say in Los Angeles? I don't think so. That's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure much of what we are is certainly cultural. You know, I mean, I guess our upbringing has affected the way we think and the way we treat people, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, who knows really, but there has to be a certain flavor and attitude having grown up in Brooklyn when we grew up in Brooklyn. Right. So I'd say this definitely yeah. would be a difference. I, I, I'm not sure I know what that difference would be, but I think so. So it was like it was like a hang, and then we were we were trying to build great bases with everybody's input. You know, it was only it wasn't only us. We wanted everybody's input to see what everybody liked and, and what everybody needed to make you know to make a, to make a great base. That's what right. we wanted to do. We wanted right. to take the, you know, what we were all grew up with the traditional stuff and bring it to another level. You know, and not not disrespecting, you know, what was what we all grew up with, but to be able to do that and do and do more. Joey, would you say that um, each, you know, you specialize in setups, right? Would you say that each setup of a bass is like a unique fingerprint? I know the way James likes his bass. You know, when, because James has been to the shop so many times. I know when James comes, I know what I have to do to make James, James's bass play well. When Mark comes, I know the way, I know Mark's set up now. When Mark would come to the shop and, and I watch Mark play and I, so I kind of like put it all in my brain and I keep it in the, my, my computer's in my head, you know? Right. And, uh, and so over the years, I've, you know, I've known, well, I know Mark likes that. I know he plays like that. Anthony's, Anthony's set up, Victor's, uh, Mike Pope. <laughs> when I met Mike, Mike came to us with a, remember that when we first met Mike with the Smith bass? Then we started talking. I asked Mike about electronics. I said, you know, I says, I'm, I'm looking, I'm searching for this, this tone. I says, but every time I talk to the, the guy who was making uh, electronics at the time, who they were great electronics, but there was something that, was, that wasn't right about it. It always had like a blanket effect over the tone. I knew what I wanted to hear, and Mike, Mike kind of knew how to dial it in. Right. You know? and, uh, right. and then both of us, because we're both bass players, and we both kind of like, you know, we both all love the same. We all grew up loving all, what everybody's doing. Right. So we, uh, we, and we achieved, uh, you know, at building a preamp. Then David, David came into the picture. Right. With, with him and Mike together, working together. And uh, it was... Uh, it was like everything, like everything was, would always roll into the, you know, into a good spot. And we were able to like, you know, if there was something that wasn't right, we knew about it because we had friends that would be honest with us and tell us. And so, you know, it was all like, you know, everybody was involved and it was so, you know, it was great. It was like, uh, it, was, it was like making music. It was like we were making music, building basses. We wouldn't be where we are without all you guys. So thank you all. Really, it's, it truly has been a collaborative effort and still is. And that's the joy of it. We really enjoy the exchange between us. And we learn a lot from all of you. And it all goes into the bases. So right. it's, it's all of us. It's not just Joey and me. So I just want to say that. All right. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. He's an innovator. He's a composer. Uh, he has Mike Pope, uh, jazz .com, uh his, which is an amazing website if you want to go see some of the things he's doing, um, uh, get involved maybe with some of his, uh, his, his teaching. Um, he's played with the Brecker brothers, Chuck Loeb, Mike Stern, Jeff Tane Watts, Chick Corea, uh, which I've had the pleasure of seeing you play with, David Sanborn, Manhattan Transfer. He has two solo albums that I'm aware of. Um, and he designs even his own uh, preamps, FlexCore Premium, um, uh, internal bass preamp. And uh, Mike, let's let's dig right into it, man. Um, were you born into a musical family, or did you discover music as a kid? Okay. 
um, just on your own? I grew up in a family where, where um, if we go to a movie as a family, I, we, we, the minute we walked in the front door after, uh, after coming home, my mother would, would not even turn on the lights. She'd go straight to the piano. She'd have every song in the movie learned and just be able to play it just like that. Uh -huh. That was, and, and I don't mean just like, here's the melody. I mean, I mean, orchestrated with, um, you know, the whole thing. It's like, it was stupid. And that was, so that was the normal wow. for me as a kid. Wow. Um, and my dad was a brilliant, brilliant concert pianist too. So yeah, you know, I was, I was really, I was blessed in that way in a, in a big way. And my, my older brothers uh, had really eclectic tastes in music. So from a young age, I was listening to everything. I mean, so it just, yeah, the, my relationship with Federa was really organic. It developed organically because of that. I just remember that, I remember taking my Ken Smith bass on gigs and, and I just remember the number of people that gave me side eye particularly when I tried to slap on a, on a Ken Smith six string and were like, man, what are you doing? Where's your fender? <laughs> um, and so uh, I started pursuing ways to try to bridge the gap a little bit to find something that was a little more functional, a little bit more in a fender vein, you know, it didn't just because at that point, six string bass to me just sounded like it was like its own thing. It, yeah. it didn't it, functionally. It was barely there. I mean, Anthony was doing it. There were some guys, but for the most part, and, and even even when I got the gig with Sanborn, which was just on recommendation, he, he called me and he's like, hey, man, I've been asking around about you, said a few nice things. And then he says, so I hear you play six string bass. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, do you play four string bass? <laughs> and uh, and I, it, so, I mean, I, and I knew where he was going with it. And I basically had to promise him that if he wasn't looking at me, he wouldn't know I was playing a six string bass. But so anyway, so so I, when I, I was pursuing in my head, just kind of like, how do I go about figuring out what to, how to make this thing sound more like what I, what I want? And I was at a, a record date. Um, well, of my own record with uh, a brilliant and unfortunately tragically no longer with us bassist named Ned Mann mm. um, who was like really <laughs> an amazing musician upright and electric and, I mean, you, you know, did you know Richie did you know him? A... No I didn't no he was brilliant man I mean really brilliant and he's a good engineer and everything he mentioned Federa he says you should go meet the guys Federa so I went over and I met him and yeah so like like Joey said we ultimately just um uh I, I I had I had gotten bold with my Ken Smith bass had taken all the electronics out of it went to the like the hardware store bought a router and just laid it on my kitchen counter had no idea what I was doing I just went man you should have the, the sawdust in my little apartment in Brooklyn it was hysterical it was just everywhere I had no idea what I was getting into mostly based on just being kind of clever not really having any training in electro electrical engineering um i uh, uh they just decided hey you know what would happen if you made an active circuit and i said well, i don't know let's see so i did it and I, and uh there's a long story there that i won't go into but but i, I built one and yeah I and mean, it just kind of worked and so we we went with it but for all the knowledge and all the time that i put into making what i think is a really great preamp it doesn't even come close to the amount of time and effort I put in to be a good enough bass player to play with Chick Corea or with, you know what I mean? I mean, it ain't even in the same ballpark. So I, right. it's why right. I don't, I, I, as much as I'm very proud of what I've done, um, it, it, you know, when it comes to electrical engineering, I ha I'm very careful to defer to the people who understand it to the same level that I understand music, you know, which is somebody like David, for example. Let's actually uh, hear from you, Dave. Yeah, can you hear me okay? No, I hear you. Yes. Fine. Yeah. Good. Wow. I, I went to uh, engineering school and I, I'm an electrical engineer and, and I played some bass on and off and, and stuff. And, you know, I got to where I was, I was playing bass okay. And then one day, you know, years, years later, uh, I see this thing come up on the internet about uh, Steve Bailey's Bass at the Beach, uh, which was with Victor Wooten. And uh, I was like, man, I got to I gotta do this thing. And so, uh, Turns out that, that Mike and I had a mutual friend. Uh, he was a friend of mine from high school that Mike knew when he was over in, in Bowling Green. 
And he's like, yeah, check out this Mike Pope guy. I was like, yeah, okay, you know, whatever. So anyway, I get to this base of the beach thing and Mike and I just started talking and, and uh, uh, we just decided we needed to, uh, we needed to do some stuff together. And I ended up getting this freak trip to New York and I hung out with Mike for, you know, like an afternoon and, and, uh, and we just said, yeah, this is, this has got to happen. And, and so we've, uh, we've been pushing the envelope uh, pretty hard, I think on, on uh, base preamp stuff. And uh, my, you know, my, my background is in analog electronics, but I do a lot of medical device stuff. And I was just telling Mike, I, I had my 200th U S patent issue this week. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. It's uh, I, I remember wow. when I first got my first one, I thought, Great. man, that's pretty cool. And now I have 200 of them. I, I'd always aspired to have a really nice instrument. Uh, and, um, uh, I, I, you know, look at these Federas and I was at this base, the beach thing. I was like, man, I, I don't know if I could ever, you know, justify owning a base like that. Felix Pastorius was there, had this killing fretless base. It's like, man, I'll never be, well, I've got it sitting right over there. So I have Felix's old base and, uh, and it's just, it's killing. And uh, every time I strap on a Federa, I, I have a big smile on my face. Every time I hear you guys on, on television or, you know, in a big uh, thing, I, I hear the bass, I hear the preamp, and it just, it just does my heart amazing good to hear all that, all the love that goes into all of that stuff and the amazing players that are holding these instruments and, and making music come out of them. Which is awesome. Which I, always, I always love hearing James throw down at the beginning of SNL, man. That yeah. You, you're ba James, your bass yeah, always sounds really good. Yeah. Every time I watch a song, I'm like, yeah, it sounds good. I know it's I know it's as much because of you as it is me, but it's still, man. It always I always I, I always love I love hearing that. It kind of tickles me too, David. This absolutely. So. But, it's well, a, hey, you know what, um, Mike? I have a question for you, um, which which stems yeah. off of what Dave just said, talking about these preamps. Does that preamp when you're in a situation like with Chicory and Electric Band? Um, there's a lot of music going on in that band. Um, do you ever find yourself okay. needing to? playing passive or you always keep it in active and keep the preamp on because of all the music going on and is there are there other because you're playing like multiple bands are there other bands where you bypass the preamp and just maybe stay in passive because it's a, a more hmm, less music let's say going on i don't I, no, rarely actually just because uh um the way that I the way that I I set my stuff up I mean just only and I only even have a philosophy about this because I've been asked what my philosophy is before so but that is that like I really I really set my tone at my amp and with the bass I leave the preamp on because I don't I don't want loss loss from the cable I don't want any of the I want I still want the buffering but I generally leave it completely or very nearly flat I, I'd like to jump in for a second. Go ahead, Bing. We've been very lucky, extraordinarily lucky to have Mike work with us because it's not, it's not common to have someone who understands the electronics and musical instruments who's also a great musician. And he can, he can bridge the two. He, can, he knows what sounds right and feels right to a musician's ear. There are many brilliant electronic designers but often their work might say to a musician, just sound a bit too clean or too sterile or too hi-fi, you know? But Mike uh, can understand what you want to hear, what a musician, what, what sounds right, what frequencies sound right. So we were really lucky to find that combination of great musician and electronic designer in one person. And well, that was, I mean, and, that, that, that's a, and that's a thing too, because honestly, that, that I mean, I remember it, it makes a big difference. It's one thing to to play this gig there and that gig here and whatever, but it, it really is, unless you've been on stage in front of 10,000 people one night and then in front of 8,000 the next night, and, you know, and they, unless you've done that, the, you just, you're lacking a certain perspective <laughs> that you really need in order to make right. something that, that, that is like this, you know? Um, uh, I, I remember when I was on tour with Chick, I can remember I had a butane soldering iron and I remember doing work on my base, like in the bathroom at night. Like, you know, I mean, so it was, it was, and there's a did story you, behind that that I won't get into. Either, did you at I, least have a backup base with you just in case you no. uh, completely destroyed it? No, no, no it's well, gotta I, work. The one I, I know, yeah, I know how to not destroy it. I mean, I never took it that far. Okay. But you know, but, um, uh but you know but yeah like i had a wire broke at one point and i had to go in you know that kind of thing whatever but okay. yeah it was crazy we, we've all had our time with soldering irons in the bathroom between uh, sets 
Not me. David, you I, promised you weren't going to talk about that. Anytime you need something, <laughs> I always carry spare parts all the time. I carry, not, I carry Joey's number in my phone. That's that's. that's <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and now I see I got to make sure I keep Mike on 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 speed dial as well when I'm in his area. Well, I carry. I have Mike's. Um, Mike. Sometimes Mike will tell you. I've called him up with some like customers ask me things, and I'll call. I say, wait a minute, and I call him up. I say, Mike, can we do this? You know, he wants this, this, and that. He says, let me think about it. So he thinks about four seconds, and then he says, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> so, and we and we wind up doing these crazy things that these people want. You see, you know, to, to achieve their sound, and we give it to them. It's great. It's just great. So, hey, hey, Mike, do you, um, is there any other pastime? Like, what does Mike like to do other than play bass and build electronics? Well, I have, a, I, have an, I have an affinity for cars that I can't afford. So oh. I work on cars a lot. Oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I mean, I'm a big BMW fan. And so I, 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 but yeah, I can't. I mean, man, I'm a musician. Like, you know, <laughs> so, sometimes homeless people will be like, can I have a dollar? And I'm like, I have a BMW. I don't have a dollar. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I'm kidding. But 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 um, but uh, um, yeah. I mean, that's something I've done. I've, I've loved to do over the years. I mean, I've taken rebuilt complete suspensions and pulled rear ends out of you know and changed differentials. And I mean, I've done major major work on my cars over the years. I learned a valuable lesson from Richard Roos. That you know, it's like you, it's like you can always find a way to get money back. You can never find a way to get time back. So right before I went out with Chick. I, I was working on my car. I was underneath it. I I had it jacked up it's on jack stands, of course. I was always ultra safe about that. But but I I I, I was just I was changing a change. I had bought some heavy heavy sway bars, and so taking the the old sway bar off, and I was loosening a bolt, and I I don't know if something distracted me or whatever. But all of a sudden, the stupid sway bar, which you know it doesn't weigh much, but it's it fell about on a few inches onto my uh, right here right Ooh. so i'm like man that hurt you know kind of shook it off and then i continued to work and whatever and then i i i, I come I, I i i see something out of the corner of my eye i'm like what the hell is that and i reach up and i've got like a freaking bump like the size of like my fist right over my eye and i'm going to be leaving on the road it was only going to be like another three weeks or something before i had to leave my next day my eye was black I looked like shit. I didn't know what I was going to do because <laughs> was like, oh no, did I still my eye? I had still had black, like blood vessels in my eyes when I was like, when I went to the, when I went to the, the one marathon rehearsal. For right. That gig. Wow. Um, what were those like actually? Now that you mentioned that, I'm glad your eye got better. Those uh, mar marathon rehearsals. So I guess Chick wasn't necessarily into like doing like a week's worth of rehearsals before before. No, no, before. actually, no. It was it was really it was pretty intense. I mean, I only did the one. You know, I did the one tour. I it's about a six week long, something like that thing mm -hmm. that was subbing for John when he couldn't do one. And 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 I, uh, so we he Chick sent me the music, and I worked on it. And of course, you know, a lot of it I knew already, you know, I right. mean, like a lot of match, yeah, of you know, I knew that when I was 15. So, you know, I didn't have to practice it very hard, but, but, uh, we had one, we had a rehearsal, we had an all day rehearsal in Somerville, Massachusetts, in the, in the place where we were playing in the Somerville theater, we had one day of rehearsals, tour started the next day. That was it. Boom. Just wow. have, just basically it was have your shit together. It's a lot of hard music. Yeah. Rehearse. I did my homework, so there was no problem. <laughs> Through it was about a six, eight hour rehearsal. We were done. That was it. Tour started. Wow. So, so. That was your, that was was that your first time playing with him, or you already done yeah. a one off before? No, no that was it. Wow. Was it. So yeah. I mean, I went to his house and sort of auditioned, you know, with him, me and him and Weckle a few okay. months before. But I mean, in terms of actually playing out with him, yeah, that was it. Okay. So, you also played with the Brecca brothers. You had a pretty special relationship with Michael and Randy. Yeah. Well, I had a I had a very special relationship with 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 Mike, and I still do with Randy. Although I never technically played with the Brecker brothers, I played with both of them in one situation or another. I never played with the band. Uh, I, I was content listening to James do that. Yeah. But uh, but uh, I, I it was and they never asked. But anyway, but um, but because they had James. Because they, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but uh, the, yeah, I mean, I still, you know, they're, they're, 
it was yeah i don't know i mean it's so hard for me to I don't really have to like to talk about mike i mean it's because it's like god it was so incredibly sad he right. was ultra ultra supportive super sweet to me and and um uh he was he was an advocate and uh and and randy and randy still is i mean when i i when i we got the gig at berkeley i, I randy wrote me a really nice letter of recommendation you know it wow. was cool and very cool and um uh yeah it was very sweet you mentioned berkeley how much do you enjoy enjoy teaching educational wise over touring i never thought i would enjoy it as much as i do i still get to do some stuff but i actually love i love teaching it's really kicked my butt as a player big time big time it's i've fixed more things about my playing that have needed to be fixed for so long wow. um, and uh uh with lincoln mm -hmm. and with Victor, with Patatucci. Steve, I mean, I get I get to hang with these guys, and John Patatucci and I, who also have a long relationship, and, and he's, we're very good friends, and he's also been a huge, huge advocate for me. Um, he and I have gotten to actually teach a little bit together this semester, which was awesome. I mean, we wow. got to sit in the same room and teach like one student, um, you know, for a couple of day, a couple of days a week for, you know, a few times. And yeah, there, that'll kick your, that'll kick your butt. You know, you think you sound good. And then, <laughs> and then John plays and John says, yeah, I'm not John. Yeah, that's cool. But check this out. It's like, no, I don't want to hear that. Don't make me feel bad. <laughs> Are you working on anything new right now? Projects? I've, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of music that's kind of like some's written and some is not. I'm just trying to kind of pile up another massive material to do something with. Yeah. Um, I really want to get together with, uh, I really want to get, try to, try to put together another kind of more groove oriented thing, more electric, uh, hopefully with my favorite drummer. Uh, Who's that? Brian Dunn. You know Brian? Oh, do I? Do I? I mean, Brian is come on, man. Anyway, so I'm hoping I can. You know, we 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 keep we keep like coming this close to to play. You know, we were gonna do this, and then that didn't happen. We're gonna do that. Yeah. Just like dates, and it's it drives me nuts. But uh, I really just I love playing with the cat, and uh, um, I'm hoping that I'd like to do something with him and with Jeffrey Keezer. Uh, and that would be the core of a that would be the core of a of a of a group right there for sure. So it's kind of what I have in my mind, but you know. Name another favorite great drummer. I'm sure Dave Weckl was amazing playing with him, right? Oh D yeah, D Dave. Oh, well, I mean, D Dave is he's a, not much you can say. I mean, he's the most. He's like the most solid, probably predictable drummer. You know, he he really just he just managed everything. It's just always exactly where you expect it to be all the time. Right. Um, Mauricio Zotarelli is another one of my absolute favorites, and, and, and he's Brazilian. I don't know if you know Mauricio. He's a Brazilian no. guy who um, uh, I met playing with Prasanna, this Indian guitar player who um, had had just done a record with with Victor and Al Alfonso Johnson on on it, and then he, he had to do some gigs and mm -hmm. ah, so many so many different. I play so many different. Stuff. I mean, like Tame. For, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Is uh, it's in completely incomparable, in my opinion. You know, like to see him, he just he just appears very sort of comfortably in control of everything. But there's this intensity coming out. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that works. Okay, give me give me a quick history on that beautiful bass behind you. Oh yeah, so this is a it's a it's a, a Czechoslovakian bass probably late 50s. Um, I bought it a couple of years ago from a bass seller here in Cincinnati. And uh, uh, it just it just felt really good. Uh, wh whoever had it before had taken the finish off and they made the F-holes bigger for some kind of, you know, stage presence or whatever. But I was born in 1961 and there's a sticker on the inside where somebody had taken the top off and worked on it, put their sticker in the 1961 on it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Very cool. That's very yeah, That's a neat thing. How often do you play it? Not enough. Okay. <laughs> Too busy with a lot of other things, but uh, yeah, yeah, man, that's, yeah. that's fun. I've, I've got a, a couple of really nice Federa basses. Um, I just absolutely love them. 
Well, it looks really good sitting there. And I appreciate you coming on, man, and, and, and sharing the story with the collective uh, 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 unit between you and, and Mike and, and, and meeting up with, you know, doing what you do with, with Federa and uh, fine tuning these preamps, these, these amazing preamps in these bases um, over the years. And uh, keep doing what you do, man. Mark Kelly, you know, he's a great player. He also plays electric and upright. Uh, he plays with, or has played with, Najee, Most Def, Will Calhoun, Queen Latifah, John Schofield, Chris Bodie, D'Angelo, Usher, Mariah Carey, The Roots, and he holds down the bass on uh, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon and The Roots. Mark, what's up, man? What's up, man? I'm doing good. Philly? Is that where you live? No, I'm in, I'm in New York. I'm in Staten Island. Oh, you, you live in Staten yeah, Island? We're neighbors. We're neighbors. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Where, yeah. were you, where were you born, Mark? Uh, Houston, Texas. In Texas. Right, right, yeah. right. And you went to Berkeley, right, on a scholarship? I did. What was that like? Berkeley was, a, it was, it was a balance for me because I, I got there and I, I kind of dove into playing out a lot. It's like kind of quickly as soon as I got there and it became this, uh, it became this balance of going to school and playing. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of did that. I did, I did a lot more playing out in the city um, over time, but I mean, it, it just kind of ended up, that's just kind of how the cards fell for me in Boston. But I mean, I love Berkeley. Berkeley was, Berkeley was a, a, a great, I learned a lot there, but I also made a lot of great connections there that I still have, you know. Right, today. right, absolutely. I mean, you know, once, I mean, Berkeley carries this prestige, like once somebody's identified as a, uh, a product of Berkeley, like it's, it's just automatically, you know what, and I'm gonna ask this question, it's automatically assumed that they're just a beast at, at their instrument. Is that necessarily true with everybody that goes there? No. Oh. I mean, <laughs> no, don't even talk about it. No, no, excluding you. Case you know, we know you're a beast. I don't know. I mean, they're just different levels of players, and you know, I think you're. We're all products of our environment, and some people come from more intense environments where there's a more competitive environment. Like for me, I went to a performing arts high school, and our school compared to a lot of other schools, they didn't have that same type of environment where they were with their high school kids who were checking out a bunch of records and transcribing solos and coming back and playing these transcriptions like that. That wasn't like a common high school environment. Mm -hmm. So for, for the people that I was around, like that was what was common. And then to go to Berkeley to be amongst other kids who were coming from environments who, you know, where they were were intense environments but may not have been as intense as others you know what i mean like some of these guys are strong players from where they come from but then they come to berkeley and you have these other kids who you know come from a i guess more intense environment so i mean everybody i think i feel like there there are people who were good and there are people who are incredible you know right. that were, okay. you know got you but you know it was one of those kind of things but you know a lot of great players were there though yeah. Just, can I just add one thing? Yeah. Because I I agree with Mark totally. I was just going to say that, from my experience, and James knows this too for sure. Uh, uh, that that um, I mean Berkeley. You know, you have everybody has to have a principal instrument, and it might be bass, but not everybody's a performance major. So you have guys that are music production and engineering, or songwriting, or whatever. You know, that 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 are taking bass lessons, and they may not be. Mm -hmm very good and they may not ever be really really great because it's not really their focus in my opinion you know you go to college you, you pay for a network that's really what that's Absolutely. what that's what you get you know mm -hmm. berkeley's wow. got a good one so yeah berkeley. i say that all the time you know a, a lot of um and a lot of random people like a friend of mine who was just a guy that was always hanging around a bunch of people i knew ended up being a um he ended up being like a publicist for 50 cent at the time, the rapper who was big at that time, but then he uh, he went from there to being an A and R at Interscope, and then he uh, he kept he kept cl kind of climbing the chain, and he kept opening doors for a lot of other people that that you know I know from Berkeley that you know to come in and start making money to be producers and to make hits and to do all these things. So it's you know I, you wouldn't know these people otherwise if you hadn't gone to Berkeley. But you know the person who was down the hall 
is now, you know, I don't know, some, somebody's tour manager or something, you know, and when they're looking for a bass player, they're saying, oh, try this person, you know, give this person a call. So, you know, Berkeley is right. definitely like a, a crazy network. When you go to that school, you're definitely paying for a, uh, to the, to the music industry's future for right. that connection, you know. Right. What was your first Pearl Music gig, Mark? Uh, first pro music gig. Uh, I mean, outside of Berkeley, the first thing I got when I left Berkeley was going out with John Schofield. Oh, nice. Upright? And, uh, no, it was, uh, I played electric. It was his okay. Uber jam band. Okay. And, um, that was, that was kind of, I got, when I was at Berkeley, I still had like a year left and I went and auditioned for it. And I, it was like, it came down to between me and, uh, Andy Hess and right. Andy ended up getting the gig and I stayed at Berkeley and then Andy went on to go play for Gov government mule. And then John wanted to go, he needed another bass player for, for the, for their tour that they were doing. So then he called me and uh, I, that was the first thing I did. That's what that gig actually got me from Boston to New York. Wow. So, so that gig was like my, uh, I was kind of wondering how I was going to leave Boston and I got that gig and I, all the, it like came at the right time. It was like all the money that I got from that gig, I settled all my debts in Boston and had enough to like get a U-Haul and move to New York. And that was just, wow. you know, that was how I got here. So then when you moved to New York. Just when I first got to New York, I was, the interesting thing was that I was looking for places to go play and all of the people that I knew that lived in New York were never in New York. They were <laughs> always out on the road. So, you know, it's like, you moved to New York not to really play in New York. You know what I mean? So that was that was the first thing. So I just kind of went around and I was looking for anything that was like funk or groove related in New York. And the only thing places I was finding were like places like um, like the way I played in Boston was a club called Wally's Jazz Cafe. That was kind of where I was at for my whole time in Boston. And um, I was looking for something that was similar to that. And the closest thing you could find are places like Cafe Wa or The Groove or the Fat Black Pussycat. So I would go and kind of go around to those bars and they kind of had a real close knit group of musicians that it was, you know, they wouldn't let you come in and play. And I kind of just had to go there all the time until finally somebody asked me, like would let me play. Right. And, uh, and then little by little, I started getting on. I just kind of had a couple nights a week there. Like I would play on a Tuesday or an open mic night. And, um, and then I would get called to do little gigs here and there, but that was kind of how it started. That was how I started playing in New York and just kind of making friends with musicians in the city. How long did you? How long were you in New York? Uh, what before I started playing there? No, well, like during that time, like because did you leave New York and end up in? I'm trying to get to the connection with um, Quest. Oh no, I never. Um, I never left New York. I stayed in New York the whole time. The way that. Uh, the connection between me and Quest happened was that uh, a friend of mine was the bass player in the Roots who had been playing for that time, Owen Biddle. He had decided that he was going to leave the band because he had other things that he was going to pursue. Mm -hmm. And when that call, when that happened, I happened to know somebody who was in the room when that conversation was being had. Ah. And that, and but prior to that, I had also did a um, Christian uh, Quest was curating a show for the Blue Note, and Christian McBride was going to be the bass player for that. But Chris was out on the road, so they needed a bass player just to sit in for the rehearsal, which was like an eight-hour rehearsal at NBC. Wow! And so I got called just to do the rehearsal, which is like better than any five-minute audition you could ever have. <laughs> so we did like an eight-hour rehearsal, which we, and at that time our manager, who's now deceased, Richard Nichols he used to get all the recordings and he would listen to everything that would happen okay. and he listened to those recordings. And then he asked me to record on uh, Betty Wright's album that they were working on at that time. I did that. And then he asked me to be uh, the bass player for their B band for their 4th of July thing in Philly that they would do. And that was in July. And then I think at that time I was deciding that I was going to move back. I wanted to move back to Houston and, uh, I I went and was I went to Austin and I was about to like check into a hotel room to go look for places the next day mm -hmm. and right after I like 15 minutes after getting in my hotel room in Austin I get a phone call asking me if I wanted to join the Roots. Wow. 
and then that was that was the end of it. So I just stopped everything and had breakfast the next morning and then, you know, came back to New York and that was the end of it. So I, I guess it was safe to say you didn't bother to get that plane ticket to go back to Houston. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. I know, I mean, you have, an, you have a couple of Federas, right? Which one would be your more go-to Federa between uh, the show or touring? This one. <laughs> The one that uh, they made, guys made this one for me. It's basically a five string version mm -hmm. of uh, of Vic's bass. Mm. I love this bass. The thing is, I took it on the road a couple times and I was always afraid that it would get damaged. And you know, like I, I this bass is, you know, anybody who has a Federa knows that these do not come cheap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, it, it would pain me for it to be, uh, you know, for it to get damaged. But it, that, that's my favorite bass. I love that bass. For what, do you, what is it that you love about it sonically? Um, Sonic, everything, it's very punchy. It's very clear. And I mean, it, it works. I, I use that bass live and I can also use it for recordings. Like it always, everything always translates. The bass at the bottoms are clear, mm -hmm. they're punchy. Everything is good. When I, I can get every tone that I want. If I want to get anything that's dubby and, you know, real, real, low, really heavy basses, bass tones, I can do that. If I want to get a Jocko tone, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I, can, I, can, I can find everything. And I'm like Mike, I leave my bass flat on my EQ usually. And then whenever I need to do anything special for any, you know, for any particular sound, I can just make those cuts real quick and I can usually get to where I need to get to. I, I get the sound I'm looking for. Kind of. Right, right. To see see how it, how it works best. <laughs> yeah. That's passive, passive EMGs in that case. <laughs> The passive EMG. <laughs> hey, whatever works. Let's, you know what I mean? It's yeah, just, you know. yeah, yeah, no, that's good. So let me yeah. ask you this. Um, you did a uh bass loops volume one. What was that like? That was really cool. Um, that was um that was done with a friend of mine from Berkeley, actually. Um Ryan Ryan Groose. He um he put that company together and I, I didn't understand the concept at first, but it was, um, and I didn't realize who all was involved either. It was more just a phone call of, hey, do you want to record some, some bass loops? And I'm, sell so I'm selling these loops. And I realized they work with all the different workstations. And you, uh, it's like, if you want to have, like, Omar Hakim is one of the guys that did loops. So if you want to have some, make some music and use Omar Hakim's grooves or his drums, you take them and you literally just drop them on your workstation in Ableton or Logic. And then you can build a song around him playing drums. And, you know, you have Omar Hakim on your track or on your... Right song or whatever but um it was really cool we went and set up in a studio and um they just played a bunch of different drummers a bunch of different drummer grooves that they recorded and i just played anything it was just like play whatever you want we spent like a couple hours in a studio mm. i played and then he um he next thing i know these loops are, are out like he just put them everywhere and he's, he's selling them and it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. My mom doesn't quite understand the concept. She sees them and she thinks it's like, it's, it's my bass record or it's my bass <laughs> album, you know? So she's like, I bought three of them. So, yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you know what they're for, but you know. So she's like, my son has a bass album called Loops. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, your it's mom, is your mom musical? Your, your mom? Uh... My mom's a physician, but she, uh, she sings. Wow. Wow, what's the concentration in the medical field? She's a family practitioner. She's she just recently retired. Wow, we commend her, man. Um, was she affected in any way by everything that's going on, or had friends that are? No, to my knowledge, I mean, my parents have both been um, unaffected by this. It's cool. I like I like that I can call her up and ask her, you know, medical questions about things that are going on, and you know, to get her perspective mm -hmm. about stuff. So I always feel like I have you know, somebody real close by to kind of fact check all the things that are going, because there's all, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and right. craziness going on. So, you know, sometimes I hear a lot of compelling things and I just call her up and ask her and, you know, and then she'll, she'll kind of lay things out to say, well, that's not really scientific thought or, you know, whatever. So, I mean, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're good. They haven't been affected. Um, you know, everybody's spirits are high and, you know, it's good. They're they're in a in a good place. So I'm happy about that. Well, shout out to your mom, man. Uh, you know she was she's still a front line. I you know they were trying to call them all out of retirement to bring them all back. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. Shout. What's your mom's name? 
Dr. Janice Kelly. Dr. Janice Kelly. Shout out to Dr. Janice Kelly. What's a normal day like for you with the Tonight Show? Um, a normal day. <laughs> normal. That's yeah. the first thing. That's yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that place is crazy. It's. Uh, I mean, it's cool. It's. It's. Um, depending. I mean, every day is kind of different depending on what they need the band to do. Mm -hmm. And the band, sometimes our duties go beyond just playing. Sometimes, you know, we're involved in sketches or uh, we have right. to do visual recordings for things or being be, uh, recording in uh, bits for the show. But a typical day is, you know, you, you come in and um, like I'll say Monday is usually like a hectic day because we have to get all the music out of the way that we're going to do for the week. So we have, um, we do what we call sandwiches, which are the commercial bumpers. And uh, we come in and we record the whole week's worth of, uh, you know, for bumpers that we have to do for the show. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, the walk-ons, mm -hmm. which are the music for each guest for the week. So then um, we tend to record all of those things in one sitting, which takes like, you know, an hour or so, a little over an hour, uh, depending on how much, you know, what, what, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, there's, there are themes for um for different bits like that the writers come up with new bits that they need and they say they need a theme song and it's you know it needs to be seven seconds and a lot of times if nobody's there i get to do those i get to have the fun to write those themes by myself which is oh. interesting which sounds fun because i get to play everything and i and i sing it. I, it I always compare it to have you ever seen the movie boomerang yeah where um where the uh the guy the guy did the uh they they Eddie Murphy let, I forgot his name, the guy who used to do the 7-Up commercials, they let him, they let him be in charge to make this uh, Strange commercial. Yes, yes. And it ended up being really just off the charts and nothing like what they wanted. Right. But that's what happens when they let me write those themes by myself. <laughs> they end up getting real crazy and they sound, you know, they, they sound real crazy, but it's a lot of fun. So that's, that's a part of my day. And then um, about an hour before the show starts, they shut everything down so we can start getting dressed and getting ready for the show. Mm -hmm. And then um, we go on. We, we usually go out to the audience and do a quick root song or something for just to get just to warm up the audience. And then um, and then we get in positions and then Jimmy comes out and we do the show. And then uh, then it's a wrap and then we're out of there. I go out to uh, Florida and um, two years ago, maybe. I, I think it was about two years ago. We were in, me and my kids were in Universal Studios and we said, hey, let's get on the uh, Jimmy Fallon ride. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we go to get on the Jimmy Fallon ride and, and we go inside and there you are, man, playing bass, like right in front of us. Yeah, we, uh, we were there when they, uh, when they opened the ride. We did a week, the show did like a week at Universal Studios. Right, when right. On the ride. Right. So you're, you're yeah. the first uh, bass player to play on the moon. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty yeah, man. cool, man. Like, what is that? What does that feel like? I mean, I mean, like the roots are in Universal Studios. You're a part of that. You're in, and and you're playing. And you, you know, Federa is in Universal Studios. Um, I don't want to give too much more away, but you have to go um, and and experience that. It, it's amazing. We get it on it all the time. They all, what was the, uh, I forgot the quote, DJ AM's quote was, if you ever want to make God laugh, you tell him your plans. And <laughs> this was never, ever something that I would have envisioned for myself. Do you remember the first time you heard James Jennings play? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, I, 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 when, I, when I first started tuning in, like, like listening to James, to learn how James played, I got called to sub for James. Uh, with Chris Bodie. Wow. And it was, it was like, it was kind of one of those things where it was like, they, the whole bunch of things happening, it kind of came down to the wire. James had to go back to play for SNL and uh, they were having a tour. And I, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Chris Bodie's music, anything about the band. And then it kind of just showed up and it was like, all right, check this stuff out. And I started looking up uh, all the stuff that they were doing. And I was like, man, there's no way I'm gonna do this shit, man. Like, like how, you gotta go from Jesus. Like, you know, it was one of those things where I showed up and I almost wanted to tell everybody, like, listen, if y'all expecting that, right? Don't expect 
that, you know, but it was uh, that, you know, I listening to James and, you know, picking James apart and what he plays is, you know, it's, impo- it's impossible. James is an athlete of a musician. He's an athlete of a musician, man. You're, you're absolutely right with that. And, 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 but so are you. And thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. Exactly what Mark just said. I had the same, you know, for me, um, it wasn't to sub for you on a gig. To me, it was, I would, I just happened to be playing a record and I was like, who is that on bass? You know, I, you know, honestly, I was a big Anthony Jackson fan and I, I kind of thought it was Anthony, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and I looked and I was like, James. And again, I would, like Mark said, I was trying to pick the music apart. I feel like I owe you a bunch of money for lessons, man. Man, you're a monster, bro. Where's the solo? When's the solo album coming out? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm I'm in the same boat as as Poker. Is it's kind of like I'm, uh, and I would think, and I'm sure Mark can assess to this. I was thinking like when this thing went down, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have all this time to do this and do this and do this and do this and no <laughs> right none none at the end of at the end of every day we are just like wiped out right of of you know being parents and entertaining you yeah. know teaching yeah. Yeah. doing all that but so i've been yeah. just jotting down ideas and stuff like that and as far as uh you know my contr- contribution to doing something but it's been in the works i just haven't felt it i hear you but you know you gotta, i've gotta, done stuff with other artists and and other things but to put my name on it not yet and i was joking with somebody the other day about like you know it's waited all these years and then i finally do something and they're like man i waited all this time for this mess you know it's kind of, <laughs> but wait a minute that's my statement what are you just, <laughs> right right but um and anthony kind of proved that to me through his career and how he plays like when he's on a track it's him it's his you know mind body soul it is a project. It is like a statement in music. It is a statement about bass. It is, you know, mm-hmm. it, if you can't accept that, then, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, but eventually it's, it's there. It's definitely in my heart to do it, but it's right. a slow process of coming out. <laughs> well, I mean, you're on enough bodies of work, man, that, that I feel like um, you make, you, you do that. You speak, you make some statements, man, that, that, can stay with people, um, lovers of the instrument and music in general, man. Like you're very musical on your instrument, you know. Um, yeah, it's no rush, man. And I feel you 100. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, but when when you do, we're all mm. we're all eagerly waiting <laughs> to, mm. to, to, to hear and, and totally support you, man. And and uh, for sure. Mm. Man. What was your first pro gig? By what? First, first pro. Yeah. Oh, I was a teenager, okay. but but playing and you know because I grew up with uh, cats like Steve Wilson. These are uh, people don't know. He's like guys that I grew up with, like the Wooten Brothers, all that. So I guess my first really big paying gig was the musicians that uh, I lived around. In order for us to make money playing, we had to play at Bush Gardens, the you know amusement park. I used to love so Kings all the Wootens played there. Uh, well, so I mean, like a, all the musicians basically played in Richmond, Virginia, at um, Kings Dominion, or in Williamsburg at Bush Gardens. Wow. Um, but uh, I think for me, I would say I felt like my first pro gig was actually subbing for. Uh, a Whitney Houston gig mm. when I first moved to New York. And uh, Mike Baker was playing drums. We played with uh, Wayne Shorter and, you know, all these cats from back in the day, Fusion era. Mm-hmm. 
And that felt like to me, like on the level of like, okay, I can, because I kind of just moved to New York and still trying to figure out what I want to do. And, but I was in the clique because I studied with Ellis Marcellus mm. my last year uh, at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. So I was in that crew. So when I came to New York, it was about that, you know, that whole vibe of, of jazz and, you know, Young Lions or whatever it was back then. But, um, you know, getting in that clique with Bramford, uh, Terrence and Donald, you know, Terrence Blanchard, Donald yeah. Harrison, sure. you know, all those, all those dudes. How did the, so that was that Brecker Brothers situation come about for you? Um, so moving up to that point, I was doing like uh, I was living in the straight head world, and I was living in the, the funk uh, Bleecker Street world. I mean, Bleecker Street. When I moved to town, I don't know if it was like this for you, Mark, when you came to New York, but Bleecker Street, every bar was like a club and people could make a living just playing on Bleecker Street. Mm -hmm. And so I had kind of found my way there um, because I used to do the jam session across the street from um, uh, the Bitter End and stuff like that. It was uh, the Village Gate and the Village Gate had a jam session on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. And then I used to see these clubs. So I used to across the street. uh, So I used to go there at night sit in, started meeting people. And, um, but I was also doing the straight ahead stuff and I was playing with uh, um, Horace Silver, um, playing with Roy Haynes. And I met Roy Haynes uh, through meeting Mark Whitfield, who was one of the first guys I met in New York. And we used to do the jam session at the Blue Note. And the jam session at the Blue Note was Monday to Saturday from 12 to four every night like without a doubt and everybody used to come there and hang and that's how you met people and so mark and i used to go out to uh roy haynes's place and you don't think about it when you're you know going there and doing because you're a kid you know i was in my like 22 21 right i'm going to roy haynes's crib and you know not thinking like oh dude like the history of who this man is you know and just his style and his, you know, swag and, um, you know, him playing with Train, you know, all that stuff. So through that gig, I met uh, Dave Kakoski, who's an amazing piano player. And uh, we did some tours together with Roy Haynes, and that turned into Bob Berg. Mm. So it was Bob Berg, Dave, and Dennis Chambers. Mm. And we did some albums and did tours and all kinds of stuff like that. That connection. What year was are we in? Chambers. What year? Mm-hmm. What year? Are we ninety. 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 Mm-hmm. Wow. So, and on that gig uh, was Dennis Chambers with Bob Berg. So, and Dennis was, I mean, I hate to say, it, but Dennis was the first brother who kind of came onto that scene, you know, on any instrument. Wow. And kind of took over. You know, he came on the scene and he was playing with all the cats all the cats that we dreamed of playing with, you know? Right. And he was from, you know, he was from Maryland and I was from Virginia and I was like, man, so it's possible. <laughs> so, um, but through the, uh, through the uh, Bob Berg gig, um, I, I met, um, I did a recording with, it's kind of all kind of <laughs> entwined together, but I did a recording with Dave during this time that I was playing with, with Bob. Mm-hmm. And um, Randy Brecker came through because Randy and Dave played together. Kakoski played together. So through that, uh, we did some gigs. We did recordings, and that kind of put you know, you know, me into the ear of Randy. So I was out on the road with Bob Berg, and Jenna said, "Hey, man, Randy's been looking for you." I mean, uh, Michael's been looking for you. And I was like, who, Michael Brecker? He's like, yeah, Mike Brecker. So Mike called me in my hotel room when I was on tour with uh, Bob Berg in Europe. And I couldn't believe I was on the phone in my hotel room talking to Mike Brecker. Exactly. And he was like, um, we're going to put this band together. My brother and I were going to put this band together. You heard of the Brecker brothers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Of course I heard, you know. And... Um, 
what was that like in the studio? Um, did you feel, well, did you, was it, was it a sense of freedom or was it pretty laid out? Um, is there amazing? I, I think on, and all these guys can attest to this, I think at a certain point, you, you get asked to, to this part of the, you know, to the dance or whatever, because you do something mm -hmm. that you do and you have a particular sound and you have something to bring to the table. And so um, that's kind of how, you know, how it was. It's kind of like, I don't think a lot went into it, but it's kind of like if it, if it didn't go so well, then you would, you know, shortly know, you know? <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah. The first first time I played with them, like I said, so that's how I met Mike on the phone. And then we would, I would go to the studio where they were in pre production, and you know, talk to Randy, hang out with Mike, talk to him. And George Whitty was there, and they were working on producing the thing. And so, and I'm thinking the whole time, like, dude, when are we going? When are we going to play? Like, seriously, when are we going to play? Like, I need to know, like, if this thing is going to be cool. And so that went on for like like a week maybe and then they asked me to uh, come by the studio and just kind of hang out some more and then I came through there then Dennis came through George was there and they were still working on some production and then Mike and Randy was like all right let's play and so we played above and below and that was the first track that we played mm. you know so it was no rehearsing no you know we just went in and did it and then that was it. That was that was the first recording. So it was all kind of like that, you know. And then eventually they send you because back then they send dats to you, yeah, or cassettes or whatever, right? Of uh, the music, and you go in and record it. Wow. So was there any reading involved in those sessions? Yep, lots of reading. <laughs> wow. I, not as much, not as much as Chick, but it was a lot of reading for wow. sure. For sure. Yeah. How about, how about transitioning to Herbie? When did that when did that happen? The, Herbie happened much later, but also probably through Mike, you know, playing with Mike and being in the in the scene and playing with a lot of different cats. But uh, uh and I knew Herbie and I think maybe occasionally we had played together or something like that throughout the years. And um he wanted to, to start this band. The first time I went out with him was like 2008. He wanted to start this band with myself, Kendrick Scott, Terrence Blanchard, Gregoire Maé, mm. and Lionel Lueke. Mm. And so it was a, a band of playing like, you know, straight ahead and the electric stuff. And we did two months on the road. And that was my introduction to Herbie. And then from there, you know, we started the relationship. Yeah, it's been like 20 years now. <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh man, come on! Yes, you're right. See, <laughs> eight, eight, 18 years. Wow, that says Jeez. a lot, man. Herbie, that Herbie does. Herbie's not interested in nobody else. James, you hold. That's like me and Mark were saying. James had all. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was not much left to do now. Were you use were you on your Federa that you have now back then? That stays home, like Mark's bass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and actually the, the original bass that I loved that was like that was that was the last bass that I knew what was in and on the bass. That was the last one. The first one and the last one. Olive top. Uh, maple fret for you know blah 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 blah, um, <laughs> and the neck would always move, and I'd be calling up Joey, and I'm just like Joey, man, the, the neck is like this way. What, which way do I turn it? And he he'd come in and say, yeah, you do this, and then I get and I got I kind of got tired of uh, um, every time I got to a new because we were traveling a lot, and every time I got to a new climate, mm. the bass would be doing something. And I just hate it because I'm like very low maintenance, slow frills. Like I, I don't want to be dealing with that. <laughs> right. When I get to some place or whatever, I'm trying to like rest or whatever, you know. And um, so when I got to the end of a tour, 
Joey was like, why don't you come down to the shop and we'll check it out and da da Because I would come in, you know, a couple times. And then he had, he had a bass on the wall. And I was like, well, let me check that one out. And then I was like, so we did like an even swap. And it was like, you know, uh, Rosewood, Fingerboard. I don't even know what it is. It might be Ash or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the five string. And that was the one from uh, the uh, the DVD, the Record Brothers Signal Live in Barcelona, I think, and all that stuff. And, and that became like my favorite bass. And, uh, but as time went on, I just felt like it was better for that one to stay at home. And I just went out on the road with uh, other ones. Right. Right, right. Now, when you're doing SNL, mm-hmm. which you've been on for how long? 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> now, that show went through a lot of changes, right? How so? It, musician-wise or what? Um, the show in general, right? Like Yes, on, yes. Yeah. yeah. On the air, off the air, is it coming back? Is it not coming back? Like, um, that's another beautiful dream gig, you know, and, and you, you're killing with with that. Yeah. Band, you know, and you guys have been together a long time, you know? Yeah. But that, I mean, it was the same thing as, as Mark. It was kind of like, I never really considered it. It was like a cool thing. And then it was even cooler when Branford took over for the Tonight Show because I was in that scene and I was like, man, so you can do that and still be cool and still play some good music and blah, 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 blah. But there's only one of those gigs and they're doing it. And, you know, the Tonight Show hadn't even like flipped. It was just like so many things, so many variables. So I never thought about it. And then I got called to do, um, to do some subbing. Um, and then had a couple of us come in and sub and and I was like that's cool it'd be fun but still I mean I was at the height of like touring with all these different artists Mm -hmm. you know things that I wanted to do and just it was busy and it was kind of like where you where you want to be you know you want to be like touring with like you know great musicians or the top of their game and on a high level and you know you're just working and um which is more intense yeah well I'll say this they 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 both have their their intenseness. It's the whole you got to use different muscles for different kinds of you know situations and stuff like that. But they're they're equally as intense. But when I when I got asked to do it, it took me like a, a minute because that's the world that I knew, and I didn't know that other world. And I was thinking like, man, I don't want to be caught in that world, and then I'll just be like the dude on TV. You know what I'm saying? because <laughs> I'm sure there were a lot of dudes throughout the years that have been killing at what they did but they became the dude on TV right so um, right. but you know Lenny assured me as as it is with Mark you know it's kind of like it's kind of sewn in with them it's kind of like you got that gig and we're doing stuff that's relative outside of what we do here and so with, with my gig it's kind of like our, our schedule is not as harsh. You know, we only do 22 shows. But, you know, I was I was shown that you can do this and do the things that you like musically because you have the summers off. So most of the big tours are in the summer. Right. And, um, you know, during certain holidays, you have, you know, you, you have the freedom to kind of weave in and out of it. And that's kind of what they wanted also not to let it get out of hand, but they want to let you be able to express yourself, you know, in other ways. Cause that draws kind of attention into, you know, the band and the show and, you know, that whole connection. What's the typical day um, showing up to the, to the studio? Um, 11 AM. On, well, it used to be three days until technology came along and then, because uh, we had a recording day mm-hmm. and then we had a day that we come and do sketches or whatever. So that got dwindled down to one day. So we come in uh, 11 a.m. on Saturday and uh, rehearse, record uh, 11 to 2, uh, 11 to 1, I'm sorry, 11 to 1. So we rehearse the music that we're going to do for the day 
for the uh, sketches, all the other stuff uh, to warm up the crowd. And then um, any kind of recordings that we do, we do during that time. And then uh, we go into rehearsing with the sketches. Mm -hmm. And then we have a dinner break and then we do uh, a run through with the monologue where the host comes out and does his spiel. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah. And then it goes on until we do dress rehearsal at 7.30, go to air. Uh, we start bringing the crowd in at 11. And then we go live at 11.30, and then it's to 1. So basically, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. Wow. So it's still three days in a sense. <laughs> Just all in <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. Mm -hmm. In your years of being a professional musician, what would you say would be one of your most embarrassing moments or man, I wish I could have redid that. So I had this bass. Uh oh. And um <laughs> I had this bass when I was doing uh, uh it's like the monk competition. Oh, okay. And um, you know, they do the big concerts and have all these people um coming doing so i was kind of a guest guest artist coming into play so they put different bands together doing different things um and they kind of uh say all right so it's going to be you on piano you on bass da, 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 da. and so there might be like i think it was the, i don't know if it was the bass competition it was one of them things but ron carter was there oh and um and he's been cool with me so cool that's that's my man i'm i'm even like kind of why are you so cool to me but <laughs> um we were using each other's bases so it was kind of like well the change is the change is going to be uh, you know it's going to be a quick change so james you're going to be playing you know your bass on this song and then ron's going to come in and da 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 so you know with bass it's a different you know you you don't have a lot of time so it's a different setup, but I can't set it up for him as I wouldn't want anybody to set up, you know, like with right. the end pin, blah, 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 blah. So I played and then he rushed me off the stage. And then I kind of told the guy, well, you got to, I kind of loosened it a little bit and said, well, you got to kind of, you know, do the hype for Ron. And this person didn't do it. And so, <laughs> so Ron goes up to play and he's picking the bass up. And I'm watching from the side, and the bass is dropping like oh. this. And I don't. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and Tane is in the audience. He's like laughing. So <laughs> he's, like, he's like, man, Ron's gonna come. I don't think he even knew it was like my bass or anything like that. But just the way I, I was like, oh. I just kind of wanted to run up on stage and be like go up on there and like screw the end pan and like tighten it up so the bass doesn't fall. But yeah, he's playing, he's, he had it up high and then it just was going. <laughs> and if you've ever had that happen to you, turned into it's, a not, it's not a good feeling. Not a good feeling. Turned into yeah. a, a high school bass on him, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a great story, man. Do you have any concerns <laughs> um, with what's happening right now uh, with, with say the music industry and musicians and um, um I, I feel like I kind of was thinking about it the other day and I, I feel like it's uh it's not only us mm -hmm. but it's the world the freedom to express yourself as a human being mm -hmm. as a person and I think as you know as bad as it is and you know it's a serious kind of thing this is we still don't know how serious it is mm -hmm. but you you know no matter what field you're in you know, everybody tries to express themselves in a certain way. They need to go and do this. They need to go and do this. They need to run this way. They need to go play some basketball. They need to hang out with their friends. And, you know, and that's, that's what I think to me has happened. The freedom to express yourself as an individual has been confined to keeping, keeping you and your family safe. If you've been doing something for so long, especially in your, your career, your field, and all of a sudden it just stops and you have another reality, it's kind of, you know, kind of takes a toll on you. It, it take, I think everybody takes a little hit and yeah. you kind of like, 
try to figure out and say, okay, we need to figure something out. But even still, we as musicians, we still don't know what the end result is going to be. Right. We do not. Right. You, <laughs> you know, it. some people can just go back to work and it's right. just kind of like you keep the social distancing. But for us, dude, the, the opposite of social distancing, you know? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm, I'm thinking like, wow, you know, I was looking at um, Bohemian Raps, Rhapsody or any kind of, you know, like at the end of the, that movie, it's like this big grandiose like concert at Wembley Stadium and people are like this and it's just like, ah. And then you think, man, is it, are we ever going to get back to that? You had a good tour coming up, right? Uh, in the summer, I believe, with, with Herbie, you know? With and, Herbie, yeah. You know, it, it's it's kind of sad. Like, I see all of these postings on different social media pages or advertisements, and I'm like, wow, they probably need to take that down now. It's about some festival or, or some big, you know, big tour. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. You know, even over at the Apollo Theater, we just got notice um, literally two days ago via email that, yeah, we're done for the year. You know, the theater won't be opening at all. Yeah, well, that brings to the point that, you know, the reason why we're here, one of the reasons why we're here, but I mean, with Joey and Vinny, what does that mean to, to them? Right. Like, I mean, in that big space, like, how do you function or can you function or is it, you know, do they have to go through some form of protocol before they can have people coming in and how, you know, there's just so many, so many questions and variables. Variables, and right. Sure. right, right. It affects us. We're waiting to get word from the city or the state to or allow our workers to come back into the shop. So yeah. we've been we've been open but operating remotely, like as much as we could from home. We're answering customer questions. We're, we're taking some deposits. You know, we're helping people out with their existing bases. They want to adjust. You know, anything we can do, we're we're still here to help. Mm-hmm. And uh, our team is, thank God, they're all healthy. They're all okay. They're all chomping at the bit. They just can't wait to get back to work. So we're all just sitting tight, waiting for the word. And when we do eventually get back into the shop, we'll probably stagger the workers, stagger the hours, try to keep ourselves as safe as possible. Right. Wear masks, we'll keep a distance, we'll keep the windows open for circulation. You know, anything we can do, keep sanitizing everything. James, is there, are there any words of encouragement you'd want to give, say, to some younger musicians that... Um, uh, admire you as much as I do. Be cool around other musicians. Be honest about yourself as a musician and be open to all music around you. Hmm. The, cool, the cool part is, I'll elaborate, there's, there's nothing worse than um, I feel like someone who feels socially awkward in certain situations, especially, I mean, we all get that way about being around uh, people that we admire and all that other kind of stuff. But there's, I feel like it, it takes practice too. But I think one great thing that I've learned throughout the years in being on the scene and whatever is making, making people feel comfortable around you. Mm. especially other musicians that are in are, that are doing what you want to do and you want to be in those cliques and, and all that you know it's, it's it's kind of a social skill but it's it's also kind of if if you feel awkward about something just don't say anything and just be around to absorb it all and and I feel like I find myself kind of being like oh man that that person is cool that I don't feel like uh, I feel like if they ask me a question, um, I'm I'm open to to answer it or to talk to them. I don't feel like I'm trying to get away from them, you know, playing bass the best that you can, and applying that to any kind of situation, that musical situation that you're in, because that leads to other things too. It might not be the path that you think that right. you want to go in, but you shouldn't like close the door on that. Right, because it might lead to like 
stuff, you know, that you never thought that you would be a part of. The, the advice I always give to any young player is, is never be too good for any gig. And to, to, I always say just say yes to any gig that you get asked to do. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, I felt like when I was coming up, a lot of musicians who were around me would often turn down gigs because, you know. Money you know, ain't right. Right, like we're living in the dorms. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, no, nah, I'm not gonna do that gig because it's not paying enough or, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, one of the greatest stories that, that I witnessed growing up that also solidified that for me was that a buddy of mine who was a drummer, I tell this story forever. I'll never say his name, but if he hears the story, he knows it's him. He, uh, he got asked to do a showcase in Boston for this band, this unknown band. And uh, he said, okay. And then the day came and he didn't feel like doing it. And he just didn't want to go do the gig. And he just decided that day, I think that, you know, either money wasn't enough for him or he just didn't want to go do it. So he called up uh, a great drummer uh, by the name of Keith Harris and asked Keith if he would go and do this gig for him. Cause he was like, I'm just not going to do it. And Keith was like, sure, I'll take it. And Keith went, did the gig and that band ended up becoming the Black Eyed Peas. And, wow. and he played with them, you know, forever and has had a great career working with them. And it all stemmed from that one gig, you know, and I, if anything, I can, I, my advice is just never, never be above any gig or any situation or any of that. I think that if somebody asks you to play, it's because they want you to be there. And I think that, you know, that's an honor in itself and go and participate and be a part of that. No matter how small the gig, you never know who's going to walk in that gig. That person might not even be uh, the Herbie Hancock or Chick Corea, but they might be that next Dave Matthews. I, I, one of the things that was a real conflict for me when I first started teaching was the idea of teaching students uh, who are going into an industry that by all accounts appears to be shrinking. You know, I mean, the live music industry. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a difficult thing to reconcile, but, but, but in, in, in my opinion, after a lot of soul searching, I really feel like this is the generation. I mean, we're obviously, as everybody knows, nobody knows anything, right? About what's going to happen. People are guessing how things are going to work out and where the industry is going to land and what are going to be the best, most viable income streams. And it's, it's all changing rapidly, but I kind of feel like this generation, this, you know, 18 to 30 are going to have a lot to do with with redefining things and and how they how they land and where they land and so i i just want to make sure that i teach these kids the history of the music that they're playing i say you know i have all you guys are all my heroes and all the guys that we were talking about anthony victor stanley old marcus nathan east they're all my heroes and I think, I mean, I've I listened to all of them all through the years, and I loved I love everything they they've done, and I just for myself as a bass player, what I did was I just want to be me, you know, just like, I think that's what you have to be, you know. Or for all the new guys that are coming up, I think the best thing to do is be yourself and play from within, play from your heart, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we do the same thing with the bases in the base company you know we build we love every one of those bases we build is like what it's like one of our kids and you know and we're all all in this pandemic together and we're all getting through it together you know and this is great because i think this is even though we can't be together live you know i mean you know in person but we are still together you know we're still together and we're still talking and communicating and that's the main thing and you know and music you know we got to keep Keep the bass alive, you know, keep the bass alive, keep the live music alive. Keep the, I think community, that's keep the community alive, right? You know? Yeah, keep the community alive and keep communication and communicating with everybody. Yeah, yeah. And, and and a part of this was was for me to, uh, of course, during the pandemic, and it's a way to, to stay in touch with everybody. But all you guys are reachable, you're touchable, you're human beings, you know, good people, you know? Um, and I just want the, the music community, musicians and bass players and drummers, anybody, to just be able to see that. And like like you said, Joey, we're all going through kind of this, and, and Anthony, we have all alluded to this, we're all going through this, um, yeah. just like everybody else. There's, there, there are no secrets. There's no secret gigs anywhere. There's no, 
you know, uh, there's just really nothing happening right now, but you can make something happen. I think uh, I'll keep it real short. I'll, I'll tell everybody something my dad told me when I was a young man. Uh, when I told him I wanted to be an artist, you know, at the time, it didn't sound like a good idea because there wasn't a lot of hope in making a lot of money and, you know, but he saw how passionate I was about it and that I had a talent for it. So he encouraged me to do it. He said, just, just put your heart and soul into it. If you're going to do it, do it right. Be the best at it and don't fool around, you know, just, just make it count. Thank you, everybody. I think this was great content. Vinny, I didn't think you'd hang out with us this long. <laughs> Vinny. Uh, I love you guys. Come on. I, I know you went to take a nap. I'm right? honored to be among such company. Are you kidding? Laura Thank you. Laura, Thank you. I love all of you guys. Laura texted me. She said, my dad went to take a nap. He'll be right back. <laughs> Not a computer took a nap. <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking. I had to get a plug and get some power back on. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. All right. See you guys. All right. Later. Yeah.